I want to start today, we've, we've been in a series about habits, and I want to start Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not conform to the pattern, the behavior, the habits of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will, is good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's take a minute and uh, pray together. God, we thank you that you're here and that's really what makes these moments matter. So I ask you to speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, like I was saying, we live uh, at the Lamberts in a very emotionally charged environment. To say that emotions are always high wouldn't be true, um, but they're always charged. So sometimes they're high, and 30 seconds later, they're low. We have big swings. We're just, we're... We're a really passionate family, and um, we're trying to help our kids understand how to better process their emotions. So it's not bad to feel that way, but now what do you do about how you feel? The problem with me trying to help a smaller human understand their emotions it is, that, is that it's very much the blind leading the blind. Because I, I'm emotionally volatile. I don't trust myself emotionally. I make bad decisions because I'm, I'm, I'm just, I don't want you to not trust me as pastor, but I got issues, emotional issues. And for example, this would, this would not be an uncommon scene in our house. In fact, I think it was a scene just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we get up early. I'm up before everybody. I get, I run and I'm feeling good. I've read my Bible. I've spent my time. With, I'm like, the day is going well. All the other humans start to get up and they take care of, they get dressed. They're, they're in good moods. They've had great night's sleep. Like it's a good morning. Things are rolling well. We're making breakfast. You know, everyone's kind of, what a beautiful name it is. We're just humming. We're just, we got worship on our, on our lips. We're just, it's a great day in the Lambert house. So like it's very joy filled and positive and uplifting. And then I can't find my keys. And it's amazing how quickly the dynamic of the house shifts, especially gentlemen. If you are the, the, the male, the alpha male in your household, know that your attitude and emotions impact the house more than anybody else's. And so mine, I know that I should keep them in check. I know that my keys are going to be somewhere. I know these things. I know them to be true. But when I can't find them, I get overrun with anger and frustration. And, as, and so I've got all of these little joyful people running. And, and they do. Like they, I'm not even joking. And it's, not, it's not like this all the time. But there have been some mornings. We've we got a lot of worship playing. And so they're, they're actually running around like, this is how I fight my battles. They're putting on their pants. I'm like, man, you guys are perfect. And then, the, and then it ends. Um, but, and then I'm like, hey, 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 guys, you can't find my keys. And then everyone's like, dad's angry. What's happening? I'm like, guys. Uh, and they're like, it's okay, dad. This is how we fight our best. I'm like, it's not. I need to find the keys. Go to the door. Put your boots on. Don't make any noise. I'm trying to think. Dad, why do we have to be quiet when you're thinking? Doesn't that... Don't ask me stupid questions. I need to find, and everything goes crazy. And all of a sudden, my soundtrack has shifted from what a beautiful name to something by ACDC. And it's going crazy, and my heart's getting overtaken with rage. We just, like, we just got big swings in our house, and I am the chief of big emotional swings. One of the things that I'm noticing in, in my children is that um, they have food swings. So their mood is impacted by their food. Not, not just by what's served. So sure, that, that's, that impacts their mood. Like, so you serve them the wrong thing and they get angry, they get upset, they get full of grief. It's like really complex. Um, but, but how it's plated can make a difference. If you got a part of, the and part of the food on the wrong side of the plate and they look at it, I like, I like it when my corn is closest to me. He's got to turn the plate. Close your eyes. Hey, it's a miracle. There's, there's food swings. And um, we had a major food swing this week. My youngest, Zara, and she's, um, she's four, so she's the least emotionally developed, we'll say. And uh, my wife had made, um, she had made like homemade waffles that we weren't going to eat because Daniel fast, but uh, it's fine. And so they were full of all sorts of good stuff for the kids and whatever. And, um, and so she's serving them up. 
And Zara looks up at my wife and says, I, I wanted an ego. <laughs> and my wife looks and says, um, well, that's cool, honey. We're having homemade waffles today. And j just worship him. It's going to be a great day. And Zara looks back and she says, Mom, you just broke my heart. <laughs> I starts to cry in the kitchen. And I'm watching it happen. I'm like, did she just say that? That's not even fair. Like, I'm sorry. I'll go get you egos. I'm so sorry. But we're trying to work through some of the emotions. So they got the food swings are happening. It's amazing. And um, the, the grief that hits our home, especially again, and, I, and I'm, I'm sort of picking on the four-year-old today because the 10-year-old's in the service. So uh, <laughs> the four-year-old, like when we say it's time for bed, she is grief-stricken every night. Like the rest of the, it's like, hey guys, go put on pajamas and brush your teeth. They're like, okay. And they race up. She, she collapses. <laughs> Honey, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> And she'll, she'll lay on the ground and say, I can't, I can't move. Ah, somebody pick me up. Like full of, like she's being tormented and tortured. Like it's, it's, it's amazing to watch what happens when you say, honey, it's time for bed. And so you gotta, you're like emotionally trying to coach her through what she's, so, like what is it you're feeling? What is it? Okay, I'm just gonna pick you up and throw you in your bed. You get her up there, but it's, it's a process of trying to understand our emotions, and, and it's not that I'm anti-emotions. In fact, I, I know that God gave us emotions, that God himself is an emotional God. One of the ways we understand him is by looking through scripture and seeing several references to different feelings that he expresses, and, and so it's an important part of who we are, but, but the thing that we're trying to learn in our family and the thing that I, I'm constantly trying to learn, even as an adult, is that I cannot be controlled by my emotions. That my emotions, my emotions um, provide like a great companion on my journey, but they should never be in control of my journey. And really when we're talking about habits, we've got to consider emotions. This is again our third week, um, looking at our different habits and uh, in the first week, what we really discussed and uncovered was that we are all creatures of habit. In fact, research suggests that up to 50% of everything you do in the run of a day is being controlled by habitual patterns and behaviors that you've got in your life. I don't believe you. That's, I know some of you are looking at me like that. Believe me, I read it on the internet in several different locations, okay? Um, no, but what happens is you do something once, and your brain forms a pathway, like actually starts to groove out a, a neural pathway um, built around that action. You do it again, the pathway happens again. You do it again, the pathway gets deeper, the path gets clear, more clearly defined. And that's why the more times you do something, the easier it becomes, the more natural it feels, because your brain is actually writing a pathway to conserve you energy to make it easier to complete that action or activity. And so, so, so that's, that's why when you get in the car as an experienced driver, you're not thinking about how hard do I press the gas pedal, I have to make sure I apply the exact amount of pressure to the brake. No, you just, do, you just do it habitually. You just do it. Things just start to happen. And so what we've discovered is, is once we know that so much of what we do is driven by our habits, it can help take a little bit of pressure off when we enter a new year with high hopes and are struggling to see those hopes fulfilled. So, so often we start into a year like 2019. It's like, man, things are going to change for me this year. Big hopes. And that's a good thing. Then we get frustrated and we think that somehow we failed. Now, if you understand habits, you realize, man, we've just, it's not that we have failed. It's that we've got big hopes and bad habits and our habits are working against us, even though we don't fully realize it. And beyond that, last week, we kind of unpacked the fact that in order to break a habit, you need to make a habit. That, that you can't just say, I'm going to stop doing something that's unhealthy and, I'm and, and, and not replace it with something better. That's, that's Romans 12, 2. We've got to be transformed. We've got to uh, not conform to the patterns, break it, and then we've got to make it be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So too often we try to break habits, but then we're just sitting there empty and void and we haven't done anything to replace it. And, and then we navigate, circle back to the toxic habit and pattern of behavior that we have. And so, 
So we've got, even last week, the hope from last Sunday was that we would walk away thinking about some good habits that we could have in our lives. And, and we talked about how to start them. You start great habits by starting small, by having really clearly defined objectives and goals, and then by just, just sticking with it. Don't quit. If you start small, think clearly, and don't quit, you'll be able to build some healthy patterns in your life. And the challenge, again, is that we've got these good goals. I think we've got these good habits queued up and ready to go, but too often, we don't actually know how to, how do you actually break the bad one to make space for the good one? So you've got the good ones queued up, and what we're hoping for is that it's a seamless transition. You know what the good ones are. We know how to start them. We know how to move forward in healthy habits. So now we've got to figure out how, how exactly do I, I break a habit to give space for the new habit to come in. James chapter 1, verse 21 says, get rid of every filthy habit and all wicked conduct. Okay, James, I hear you. Submit to God and accept the word that he plants in your hearts, which is able to save you. Notice that James tells us to get rid of every filthy habit. The Bible doesn't say, God will get rid of all of your filthy habits. It says, you get rid of your filthy habits and then replace that filthy habit with the word that God plants in your heart, which is able to save you. So we have some responsibility when it comes to breaking our habits. So how is it that we break our habits? I think to break them, we've got to understand how habits work. There are really four stages to what would be called like the loop of our behavior that every single person, like every person in the room lives on this infinite loop of behavior. It, it starts with a desire, and desires give way to triggers. Triggers are really what happens to remind us that we have a desire that's not being fulfilled. And then our triggers are what bridge the gap between our desires and our actions. And then our actions produce a certain outcome. We've got these four steps. We've got desire, trigger, action and outcome. And your behavior is operating on a cycle. All of us, our behaviors are operating on a cycle of desire, trigger, action, and outcome. And so we know, of course, that n like not every outcome is the same. That's why some of us can come into 2019, we can have big hopes, but we've got bad habits. And so we never see the fruit or the hopes fulfilled. We've the outcome isn't what we wanted it to be. And you're watching somebody else, and they come in with big hopes, maybe very similar to yours, and they seem to be crushing all of their dreams. Like, man, why are they so successful in hitting all their targets? Well, there's, there's, so we know there's different outcomes. But what is it in the, in the loop, the habit loop, that's causing us to have different outcomes? And I think if we're going to break a habit, we need to get down to it and understand the, the dynamics, the components, and where it is in that habit loop that things actually go sideways for us. And last week, we looked at the character of Daniel in the Bible. Daniel's just one of those guys. He's all virtue. No vices in Daniel. Everything seems to go well for him. The outcomes of his life are favorable. They're positive. It's encouraging. And so I think to contrast Daniel and his virtue and his great outcomes to really understand how to break habits, we need to look at somebody who's, who didn't have good practices and who things didn't end well for. About 1150 years before Jesus came on the planet, uh, Israel, the nation of Israel was in this pattern of rejecting God. And so they would they would reject God, they'd turn away from him, they'd start doing things their own way. Um, it was their pattern, it's the way they behaved, it happened over and over again, and this behavior away from God would get them into trouble. Now God also has a pattern and a behavior because he's full of grace and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in love, and so his pattern was to continually offer a way out for the nation of Israel every time their patterns took them away from him. And so he would send judges to the nation of Israel, and those judges would step into leadership anointed by God to make a difference and start leading the nation back into a place of healthy relationship. One of those judges was a guy named Samson. Samson, uh, famous for his long hair and his six-pack and his biceps. If you were, if you were to try to get a visual of what Samson looked like, think, um, 
Think like early Avengers, like 2012 first Avengers movie, Thor. Think Thor from the early Avengers, and you pretty much have Samson. I think when you get to heaven, um, that's probably what he's going to look like. At least that's how I imagine Samson. And so Samson is, in my estimation, one of the most tragic characters in the entire narrative of Scripture. He was born under miraculous conditions. His mother couldn't conceive. Uh, the Lord showed up and said, hey, I'm going to give you a child, and he's going to lead the nation into freedom. I will raise him up to be a deliverer. Miracle baby. Samson's born. God's, the, the Bible says that the Spirit actually came on him. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit to have supernatural strength. And the one thing that they're trying to navigate and make sure they control is that um, his parents were instructed to raise him as a Nazarite. A Nazarite was simply a person who adhered to a certain uh, rule or lifestyle based on the, the foreknowledge or the understanding that they're called and need to be set apart. So they avoided some things, uh, uh, fermented drink, um, cutting their hair was a big one, not hanging around with dead things or unclean. Like, so this, there's some, some basic guidelines on the Nazarite lifestyle, lived and embraced because of the conviction that I'm supposed to be set apart, God's got a great plan for me. And so this is Samson, nothing but potential and biceps, That's, that is this character in the Bible. And He's my favorite. We're reading, um, my son's got one of those comic book Bibles where the pictures are like really edgy and like it's, and Samson is just like, it's just muscles everywhere. It's incredible. It really makes me feel good about myself. Um, now, Samson, unfortunately, had some toxic habits. His, his main issue, his main vice, his main destructive tendency happened around Philistine women. In fact, we hear about his birth, and then the very next verse, like we just fast forward to Samson being an adult, and the first thing we hear about him in Judges chapter 14 is that Samson went down to a place called Timnah, which was actually a town in Philistine territory, so he goes into enemy territory, and he sees a girl, and the soundtrack of Samson li Samson's life kicks in, and it's, oh, good job, oh, good job. Da, 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 da. And he's looking at her, he's like, I'm hooked on a feeling. Da, 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 da. And, and, so, and, and his feelings take over, and he goes to his parents, and he says, I met this woman, and I need her to be my wife. They're like, Samson, we don't think it's a good idea. She's a Philistine. He says, I don't care. I love her, and she loves me, I can tell. Turns out, they'd get married. She would deceive him. And the marriage would end when she was burned alive by her own people, and Samson became public enemy number one of the Philistines, should have listened to his mama, okay? <laughs> He's got issues with these Philistine ladies. So then you, then you fast forward more than 20 years from the first marriage, and you get to what, what is probably the, the most famous of the ladies in Samson's life, Samson and Delilah. The Bible says that, again... He, he traveled. Now, at this point, he's supposed to be, he is a judge in Israel. He's got a job to do in his hometown of judging and leading and encouraging the people. But instead, he just drifts away from his responsibilities and what he was called to do. And he drifts into another Philistine town and village. He sees a girl named Delilah, and the soundtrack kicks in again. This sounds like I'm hooked on a feeling. Na, na, na. And he pursues Delilah. They start a relationship. Pattern repeats itself. She deceives him. It ends bad again. The Philistines come. They shave his head. He loses his strength. They rip out his eyes, and he starts doing slave labor for the enemy. All... Um, all leading to his ultimate death in what was uh, a, an, an, an enormous murder suicide. He took thousands of Philistine lives and his own in one moment because he's hooked on a feeling. So this is Samson. Samson 
has a bad habit. And the, the first thing we need to do to break a bad habit, and I, I would encourage you, um, if you've ever struggled with any type of bad habit in your life ever, to take notes, and hopefully this will be helpful at some point. Most of you in the room don't have any bad habits. I understand that. But for, for when you do or you start doing something years from now that you think, maybe that's not helpful for me, you might want to turn back to some of these thoughts. First thing is you've got to identify your bad habits. I don't know what they might be for you. Maybe it's a critical attitude. Maybe you complain a lot. Maybe you're prone to gossip. Maybe it's emotional eating. I, I, I don't know what the habit is. Maybe it's looking at things you shouldn't be looking at. Maybe, I, I don't know where your habits lie, but I do know that if we don't, if we don't def define our habits, we'll never defeat our habits that you've got to know what it is you're fighting if you're going to be victorious. There are too many of us who not only are we unwilling to define the habit, we're just not, it's just not willing. It's not that we can't, we just don't want to. We don't want to admit that this pattern of behavior in my life is destructive. But I promise you, if you've been believing for outcomes and not seeing outcomes, you've got some destructive behavior somewhere in the cycle and you've got to identify it if you're going to change the results. We've got to identify our habits, define them. And, and there's this little story in Judges chapter 16. So kind of wedged in between Samson and his first wife and him being a ruler in Israel and Samson and Delilah and the big murder-suicide thing. In between that, there's a moment. Judges chapter 16, verse 1. And it's so interesting to me because God always gives us a way out. And the reality is, our bad and toxic behaviors are things that we choose our way into. Where you are today in your life is your choice. We have chosen our way into our current situation, our current perspective, our current outlook. We've chosen our way there. And so if we've chosen our way in, we got to choose our way out. And God is always in his grace and mercy giving us another option, another opportunity, another chance to choose our way to a better end result. And I feel like Judges chapter 16 verse 1 was an opportunity for Samson to choose his way out. Now, I need a couple of volunteers to help me today. And um, so I'm going to ask, just because they're up here, I'm going to ask Pastor Kyle and Pastor Tay and uh, Bryce, Andrew, get you guys to come and give me a hand. Um, you guys didn't know. Again, it's the same. I'll just come right up. Let's go. Look at that. Works out, ladies. Um, and so... Uh, so you're just going to stand, you're going to hold a piece of paper for me. That's kind of, that's what we're doing, okay? So we've got over here, um, we've got the, the loop, the, the habit loop. So it starts with Andrew. Andrew is pure desire. Uh, we got Bryce. His girlfriend is pretty excited about that. Uh, as Bryce is the trigger, not Bryce's girlfriend. Bryce is married. <laughs> She's, she's upset down there, but control your feelings, okay? Um, Bryce is the trigger. Pastor Kyle is the action. And Pastor Tay is the outcome. I'm just going to move this a little bit forward, guys, or else I'll hit you. Um, but it's good for you to be there because of the light. Okay. So Samson, this is our pattern, right? Every habit we have starts with desire, has a trigger, has that produces an action, end result is a particular outcome. Samson and his life and the cycles we see in his life follow this habit loop the same way all of our behaviors follow this loop. Samson follows this loop. So Samson has desires. And what we need to remember about our desires, our desires, these almost ancient underlying motives that impact our patterns of behavior, um, these are not bad. The desires... The underlying motives, the desires that we have inside of us are desires that were present in the Garden of Eden. Things that God wired into humanity to draw us into a relationship with him. Desires for love and intimacy, friendship, companionship, acceptance, approval, significance, security. All of these things, they're great desires that God put in us. Now, he put them in us to drive us to him. The problem is that many of us try to satisfy the, these desires and we forget that God is ultimately the only one that can come through and bring fulfillment. So now we're not always aware of our deep desires. Like it's not like every day you wake up and you, you get out of bed and you think, I am looking for fulfillment, love, 
intimacy and acceptance today and I'm going to find it. It's not that obvious. Sometimes they're working under the surface, but Samson had very normal desires. His, his motive obviously rooted somewhere in love, intimacy, accomplishment, approval. So he's got desires. His desires weren't the issue. Again, I want to remind you like we did a couple of weeks ago, your desires aren't your issue, okay? So we know that our habits are producing different outcomes because some people are living the life they want and some people are struggling and never succeeding. So we know there's different outcomes, but we know the issue doesn't happen at the stage of desire because the desires were wired in us from creation. Okay, so then what happens is desires move to triggers. Now a trigger is something that makes you think and realize I have an unfulfilled desire. Okay, so that's the connection between your desires and your triggers. Something happens in a trigger that says, man, I have a desire that's not being satisfied right now. And triggers are, are interesting because what triggers do is they initiate action. And what we need to recognize about our triggers is that the triggers we have are amoral. They're not, it's not as if we've got triggers out there that there's something with their own um, moral compass trying to ruin your life and drive you into the ground. Generally, triggers are totally amoral and just neutral. And so we've got to be able to identify our triggers. What does a trigger look like? A trigger, trigger for me is Cinnabon in the mall, Okay. You would understand this because I'm sure for some of you, it's also a trigger. If you're perfect, maybe not. But for many of us, it's a trigger. You're walking through the mall. You're not even thinking about Cinnabon. I'm not going to pay that much money for a cinnamon bun. Why would I ever do that? I don't need it. I don't even really like cream cheese icing, but it's got so much sugar in it. When I get up to it and I smell it and it enters into my nostrils and it gets into my soul, all of a sudden it's reminding me of a desire for pleasure that's not being fulfilled that will be satisfied if I could have a cinnamon bun. And then I take a sample from the top and then one samples, two samples, three samples, four. I buy a six pack and it's finished before I get to the car. <laughs> it's a trigger. Now, Cinnabon obviously is not the devil, but it, for some it's, it's a trigger to temporarily meeting a desire. Now, we've got to be able to identify our triggers. I'm going to, five questions you can ask yourself to help understand what your triggers are because if we're going to break our habits, we've got to know what's triggering that toxic behavior. Five questions. Number one, how am I feeling? How am I feeling? So when you're on the verge of doing something you know you don't want to do, or you have the wherewithal to do something you don't want to do, and then you're feeling guilty and gross for doing it, like six Cinnabons in three and a half minutes, <laughs> what, how were you feeling before you did it? Write it down. I'm, like, if you would track these five things over the next couple of weeks, you would actually see the triggers in your life that are leading to negative behaviors, and then you could do something about breaking the habits. How am I feeling? Number two, what was the previous event or action? Because nothing ever happens independently. Everything is a response to what just happened. Everything you do next was determined by what you did before it. There's, it's all connected. So if you do something you don't want to do, after you ask yourself, what was I feeling? Ask, what was I doing that led, to, that led me to that toxic action or habit? The third thing you need to ask is, who's with me? Who's, who's with me? And we're going to talk more about our environment and the people that are with us next week. But you got to ask yourself that question. Who am I around? Am I alone? Potentially a problem. Am I with the same person every time I do something stupid? You probably need to, like, change your friend group. Number four, what time is it? It's amazing how, how often we slip into the same patterns of behavior. You guys good? Your arm's getting tired? I know, Pastor Tay, you've been adjusting your grip a little bit. Okay. All right. It's getting, getting pretty heavy. Um, and, and so uh, you've got to pay attention to the time. When do I do the thing I don't want to do? And, f and finally, number five, where am I when I do the thing I don't want to do? You've got to ask yourself those five questions. You'll start to identify some triggers. Um, I have a trigger on Saturday nights. I sit at my kitchen table. I look into my kitchen. I look at the cupboard. I know where the snacks are. Every Saturday night, I snack more. I probably snack more from about... 9.30 to 10.30 on a Saturday night than I do in the entire week. 
Because I sit there and I'm reading over my notes and I'm supposed to be talking to the Lord and I'm just thinking about things, but I'm also checking the sports, sports scores on TSN. I'm looking to see if the Flames are going to beat the Oilers. I'm looking at all of that. Got to check the late hockey game. And so there's a lot of things happening. And for me sitting there, that time, that place, my emotions feel, starting to feel a little bit tired becomes a trigger. And every single Saturday night, and I've only noticed this in the last couple of weeks since I started tracking these five things, I walk to the cupboard and I look for snacks every time. Now, it's been more difficult to fulfill those, what's been triggered during the Daniel fast because we just don't have a lot of snacks in our house and I'm tired of drinking carrot juice as a snack. It's not a snack, it's disgusting. Um, <laughs> but, but so last, last night, true story, it's, it's probably about 10.30, I really should be going to bed, and, but I would gotten up habitually, and I'm standing in my kitchen, like not really doing much of anything, and I don't fully even remember it, but my wife comes downstairs, and she looks, she says, uh, what, what are you doing? I was like, I, I, don't, I don't really know, and she's like, why are the cupboards open? Were you looking for a snack? Yeah, I, I probably was. This is the habit. And so you know what I did for the last, you know, 20, 25 minutes that I was sitting reading through things, I sat with my back to the kitchen, didn't get up once. You just, so you can change your triggers. You can remove triggers. What was Samson's trigger? Samson was triggered to do dumb things with women when he went alone into Philistine villages and looked at beautiful women. That's his trigger. So he could have, at any point in his life, would have been really advised, if he was in church today, if like he, this would have helped him, but he could have stopped going by himself to Philistine villages and looking at beautiful women, and then he would have stopped getting together with beautiful women from Philistine villages by himself and doing stupid things. You can change the triggers. You can remove some triggers from your life. If you know that you're up late and it's 2 a.m. by yourself and you're on your device and it leads to you browsing and looking at things you shouldn't do, remove the trigger. What, go, to, like, go to bed with your wife. I love, like, that's why I got married. I hate going to bed by myself. I always, I'm like, are you going to bed? Okay, I'm coming. I, it's, to change the trigger. So you can take, you can take control of your triggers. You can identify your triggers. And so remember, though, that his desire was healthy, and his trigger isn't, it's not as if seeing a woman is a sinful thing, but it was a trigger for him. And what happens is that your triggers are, are what bridge the gap between trigger and action. Your triggers always lead to your actions. And so a trigger initiates the action. And so we know what happened with Samson in this particular text. It says, one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. Now, he's got, his desires are fine. It's not necessarily, we don't know what she was wearing, but it's not necessarily her fault that she was where she was at that moment. But she becomes a trigger for him. The action that he chooses is, the Bible says he went in and spent the night with her. No! He was doing so good up until here. And then the trigger leads him to an action that we know is going to lead to a destructive outcome. His trigger leads to an action. And so um, Samson's desires are the same as ours. The triggers, like ours, are not necessarily sinful things. But what happens is the trigger led to an action. And so there are two ways to go from trigger to action. One of those ways to bridge that gap is with our feelings. Can you... Okay, there you go. Bryce was in the first service. Pastor Kyle, can you... There we go. Okay. Um, I should have planned that better. Uh, here's the problem, is that off, most of us let our feelings in the driver's seat. And so when we get triggered into thinking, man, I, there's a desire that's not being fulfilled in my life, our feelings take over, and your feelings are crazy because your feelings are selfish. And so your feelings are not thinking about your destiny. They're not thinking about your family. They're not thinking about your health or your well-being. Your feelings are thinking, I don't feel good. What's the shortest possible, easiest, least resistance way to feel different? That's all your feelings are processing is how can I feel different fast? That's it. And so 
When we're led by our feelings, we are going to choose to do things that could potentially be destructive for us simply because we're trying to find a quick fix to whatever desire is not currently being met. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You cannot trust your feelings. Do not trust how you feel because how you feel is influenced by what happens to you. Think for a minute. When we are controlled by our feelings, think about the things that we're actually allowing to influence, influence us. How much sleep you've had. That, that impacts our feelings. So don't make, like, be mindful of your feelings. Food. Anybody ever get hangry? Probably. The weather. Other people. There's a lot of things that impact our feelings. We've got to take back control of our emotions. We don't need to hide them. We don't need to suppress them. But we need to make sure that they are not controlling us. They're a great co-pilot. They're, they're terrible when they're in control. So how do, how do we make that happen? We've got to understand most of our bad habits are formed this way. You start binge eating. It's not that you desperately want a potato chip. It's that... There's, there's something happening emotionally. You've got a void. You get triggered. A trigger goes off and says, you know what? What's the quickest way to feel better about myself? Well, the fastest way to do that might be to grab a chip, and that's going to bring temporary relief and satisfaction. That becomes the action, and then the outcome is, man, I wish I didn't do that. And you can, you can apply the same pattern to all different situations in your life. And that's, that's why smoking. Nobody smokes and thinks, man... I would love to have a cigarette. And I'm so excited to have lung cancer someday. But you know what happens is I'm stressed. My need for security is not being met. A trigger goes off. The quickest way for me to not feel stressed is to do an action that has temporary return but no long-term benefit. Negative outcome. And so we're, we've got to be careful that we don't do what Samson did. Samson throughout his life was sacrificing his future for his feelings. And I'm telling you right now, as strong as your feelings might be, your future is not worth it. Don't give up on, I mean, think about it. God, he was a miracle. He was born intentionally, chosen by God to lead people into freedom, given supernatural strength and ability and beautiful hair. And he wasted it all because he couldn't control his feelings. And they led to destructive actions. The beautiful thing, the best thing, is that there's another way. We don't have to be controlled and led by our feelings. We can be led by our convictions. See, and, and convictions are a predetermined belief. It's when you say, you know what? I don't care what I feel like. I've decided I'm going to live this way. I'm not worried about what's happening around me. I've decided that even when I get triggered and it's reminding me that I need companionship but I don't have anybody, I'm not going to open Tinder or go to Gaza and look at prostitutes. I'm going to lean in and I'm going to pray for my spouse even though I don't even know who she is yet. I'm going to cover her in prayer and I'm going to believe that God's got his hand on her and that he's protecting her and he's raising her up to be an incredible wife. That becomes your action. The outcome is that you're going to meet her someday and it's going to be awesome. We've we can change the actions which will change the outcome if we cross this bridge with conviction. If See, emotions will continue to lead us into short-term thinking that looks like a quick fix but ends up toxic and sacrifices our future. And the issue is that at its core, when we're led by our feelings and not by our convictions, it reflects a broken belief system. Broken habits come from broken beliefs. Faulty habits come from toxic habits, come from toxic beliefs. And so what it's really saying when you live by your feelings and not by your convictions that I don't trust God to take care of my desires that, were, that he put inside of me. He's the one that made you want it in the first place. Why would we not trust him to fulfill it and produce a positive outcome? And so we've got to make a decision because it's just... Like the need for love and intimacy and friendship and companionship and acceptance and approval and security and power and accomplishment starts here from God. Why would we think that we could start listening to our feelings and not to our godly convictions and get to where we want to go? Convictions, the beautiful thing about convictions is they are not easily influenced by our circumstances. 
They're not easily influenced by our circumstances. Let's give these guys a hand. Thanks, everybody. Not easily influenced by our circumstances. And so if we really want to break our habits, we've got to identify the triggers, but then we've got to really ask ourselves the hard questions, and I'm being led by my emotions or am I a person of conviction? Because here's the thing with convictions. It almost never feels good. Are you kidding me? It doesn't feel good to work out. It's so counterintuitive. It hurts, actually. It's, it's, it's physically, it's like physical torture to exercise. But there's a conviction that if I do this regularly, my health will be better as a result. And it doesn't feel good the last three weeks to drink carrot juice every time I want a cookie. There's nothing about that that feels good. I don't want celery as a substitute for a brownie. I don't. I'm sorry. Some of you like that. Not me. I'm doing it for Jesus. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't always feel good to have self-control. That's why it's self-control. You're telling yourself and your emotions, I know that'll feel good for a moment, but it's not going to benefit my destiny, so I'm not going to do it. It doesn't always feel good to be disciplined. It doesn't always, we don't always feel like getting up and coming to church, but we live by the conviction that if I'm here with God's people in an environment where he's making himself tangibly present, that any time I open myself up to him in this context, he can change my life over and over again, that we believe and are convinced that when we get together, miracles can happen. It's a conviction. I, it doesn't always feel good to serve. All the guys that were serving yesterday and all the ladies that were serving. And I'm sure that some of them woke up this morning and thought, uh, why did I say yes? It doesn't always feel good. But we live and serve with the conviction that when we open the doors, somebody's life is going to get changed every single time because God is that good and he is that faithful. I, I don't always feel like giving sacrificially, but I'm driven by the conviction that generosity will change the world and generosity will reflect Jesus and generosity will build a legacy. I don't always feel, I don't always feel like forgiving people. But we live by the conviction that regardless of what's happened to me, I'm not going to give somebody from my past power in my future. So I'm going to forgive and I'm going to move in my convictions. I am convicted. It's better for me to forgive than to hold on to it. And I'm going to move forward in what God created me for. It doesn't always feel good to worship. You come in and you're going through a season of grief or loss or frustration or pain. You walk in and the worship team's like, what a beautiful name it is. And they're loving it and they're smiling and they look good. And you're like, stop. Your face bothers me this morning. I don't feel like worshiping. Stop smiling. But there's something inside of us. It's a conviction that knows God. I can bring my emotions to you. I can trust you with how I'm feeling. I don't need to ignore my feelings, but I need to submit my feelings because I'm not going to act on my feelings. I've got convictions and I'm going to act on the reality that when I come in and I throw my hands up and I say, God, I don't understand it. I wish I didn't have to walk through it. I wish it didn't happen to me. I wish it didn't work out this way, that he can get involved in the situation that you're going through and turn them around for his benefit. Are you kidding me? Jesus was not feeling the cross. He wasn't like, man, I can't wait. God, this is a great idea. No, in the garden, he said, God, if there's any other way. God said, there's not. Jesus said, well, I'm convicted and I'm convinced that if I get on that cross, humanity's going to be saved. And if I get on the cross, this is, and this is, this is what we believe, that our Savior lived out of his convictions, not out of his feelings, so that you and I don't have to be slaves to our feelings anymore, but we could take up convictions and live the life that he created us for. So we believe that he died and rose again to set us free. We believe that he's got purpose for us. We believe that he's got a calling for you. We believe that he's got freedom for every single person, that there's more to your life than what you're seeing and living right now. We believe it. We're convinced about it. And I'm so convinced that God wants to free people from their feelings. 
that we are not going to move any further in this year letting our feelings in the driver's seat. We're going to say, God, I've got convictions about what you want to accomplish and who you are and how good you are. And I know that nothing can separate me from your love. And you've got so much more for me than to give my feelings power and control over my future. I'd like you to bow your heads. We're going to pray together. I just really feel like there are some people in the room. And again, I can't stress enough. Your feelings are not bad, but your feelings being in control could be slowly killing you. And so, Lord, in this room, you know our hearts, you know where we're at. We just ask right now, God, that you would give us freedom from our feelings. God, we cannot do it by ourselves. God, we're thankful that we feel and that we can be passionate and that, God, you've got amazing things you want to do in every one of us, but we will not let our feelings drive. And now with everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, I feel like there's a few people in the room today. And you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet. Maybe you've never even thought about it. It's not been on your radar. Maybe you've, you've known that it's a step you need to take. It's been, it's been something you've been feeling, but you haven't really been, ah, listen, I want to tell you, uh, with conviction, I know the very best thing you can do is give your life to Jesus. And if you would trust him and say, Jesus, I can't even figure out my feelings. I'm crazy. But would you just take my emotions? I trust you with my future. I'm going to live by the conviction that you are the one that satisfies. I can't do it by myself. If that's you, you know you can't do another day by yourself. I'm going to count to three. I want you to lift your hand. That's just an outward sign of an inward decision. Here we go. One, two, three. Go ahead. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, incredible, you can, you can put your hands down, that's great, I'm going to ask you, if you raised your hand or made that decision in your heart, would you repeat this simple prayer after me, come on, you see, let's say it together, say, Jesus, I trust you with my feelings, I trust you with my future, come into my heart today, amen, amen, come on church, let's give it up for everybody that made that decision today.